Hello everybody, welcome back to the Mover Mailbag. I hope you're having a great week. It has been cold here in Louisiana, which is not great. We are freezing. And the puppy is right behind me, so if you hear her squeaking something, uh, that's her. She doesn't uh, know about vlogs just yet. But if you want to check out uh, Luna content, go to my other channel, Life with Mover. I also have some uh, writing content about differences between self-publishing, traditional publishing, and uh, hybrid publishing. Uh, so talking about that. Other channels called Life with Mover, check it out. Uh, that will be for all the non-aviation related stuff. But for some channel new stuff that's um, coming on this channel, uh, I'm going to be doing a vlog with Bell Helicopters in the next uh, couple months. So that's going to be really exciting. Also have some other opportunities uh, that I'm excited to share with you much bigger than that. So that's going to be uh, uh, really cool. Also, a uh, new vehicle coming, and I know I said I was going to put all non-aviation content on that other channel, but for the taking delivery, just to kind of tie up loose ends from the horrible experience with the AT4, I'm going to put it on uh, this channel uh, as a take delivery and initial impressions, and then uh, hopefully uh, the secondary channel will be all the continuing content with that. So a lot of great things. I hope you're all enjoying all of it. So let's get started. I've got uh, one package, so to speak, and then uh, some emails from you guys. So the only package uh, comes from Lynn, who's a uh, regular fan of the channel. She's always too nice to me sending stuff. And uh, we'll use the trusty knife that I was given uh, in one of the other mailbags, which is really awesome. I love it. Um, but this is, oh, check that out. This is awesome. So it's, Kaiser, Sniper, me, and Luna. And the sizes are all mostly correct. Kaiser would be a giant uh, in here. Uh, he's probably bigger than me, but this is awesome. This is beautiful. That is, you were way too kind. I'm going to have to figure out a place to put it on the wall. And um, let's see what the, uh, the, the card, there's even a card. She's so nice. You guys are awesome. It says, uh, new dog, new friend. Uh, CW Sniper and Kaiser, new family member, congrats. Uh, have a pause day. Lynn, Princess Luna, heal quickly and enjoy um, pestering the boys. 2021 will get better for you, but girls rule, boys drool. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Lynn, uh, for that. And then there's another card associated with it, which uh, is another, it's a dog. And it says, CW, I hope you have a sun in your face, wind in your hair kind of day. Happy birthday. Yep. Uh, this is my birth month, birthday week. So it's National Mover uh, Day. Thanks for writing books and creating your channels. Yep. Uh, so Kaiser and I share a birthday, although technically I don't know his birthday. So we just share because it's easier that way. Uh, the only dog I actually know, here's Sniper down here. The only one I actually know the birthday of is Luna because I've actually got that. Uh, but Kaiser and Sniper, we didn't get that information. So that's it for packages. She's going to take this and run off with it. Um, but anyway, oh, other stuff that's coming up on the channel, doing some helicopter content with Casmo on DCS. And we're also going to do some uh, uh, fixed wing stuff as well for him. So we're going to swap roles. He's going to teach me stuff. I'll teach him stuff and DCS. And also... Um, Firebirds, where he's going to help me with Mover Ruins movies, Firebirds. I'm doing Man of Steel, Mover Ruins movies, and a bunch of other uh, movies. So a lot of good content, plus interviews with uh, continued uh, Stormy uh, and his story. I mean, U2, SR-71, all the great stuff that he did. Amazing interview. Also, we've got uh, a, a major general. So he was the adjutant general of the Oklahoma Air National Guard. He's going to join me on the channel for an interview. Uh, A-10 pilot that had one of the kills, uh, helicopter kills, air-to-air -air kills in Desert Storm, and uh, a, a Red Air bandit who flew the MiG-21 uh, that uh, Colonel Ladd actually talked about in one of the previous videos. So he was one of the guys flying the MiG-21. So a lot of great interviews, a lot of great history coming up on the channel. So hope you'll enjoy it. All right, for the emails, first one comes from Andrew, Astronaut Experiences. Hey, Mover. I've been watching your channel for a while and I enjoy all your videos. I've noticed that you never spoke anything about 
fighter pilots and the path to becoming an astronaut. Have you ever met anyone that's pursued that path or do you know if being a fighter pilot is a viable way to become an astronaut? If you're seeing this, wish me luck on my upcoming Air Force and Navy Academy appointment decisions. Thanks, Andrew. Well, first of all, good luck. Make them tell you no. If that doesn't work out, you can still go ROTC or OTS or Guard Reserve. So plenty of options for you. As far as uh, astronauts, I just don't know any. I mean, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, a lot of them are fighter pilots, but honestly, I, I really just don't know anything about the astronaut process. So um, if I can get an astronaut on the channel, I will. Yeah, if I get somebody cool that's done that sort of thing, that'd be awesome. But uh, currently, I don't know anybody. All right, this comes from Michael. Hi, Mover. My name is Michael. I'm a subscriber to your channel, and I love aviation in general, from jet bombers such as the B-52 to fighter jets such as F-14 Tomcats of VFA-84 and F-18s of VFA-113. Had a few questions regarding this particular topic that doesn't get talked about that much, and that is missing man aerial formation. I saw the formation in your reaction video to Top Gun 2. Firstly, how are missing man aerial formations done? Like from the beginning of where the flight starts and the flight ends. Okay, so your first question, um, it's basically just a regular flyover. So uh, we'll hold at a certain location away from whatever we're flying over. We'll have a designated time over target, and we'll hit that time over target, usually with someone on the ground, uh, helping to coordinate and then when we reach the time over target as we're flying over number three will execute the missing man so we'll coordinate with atc to get a block of airspace because you know we're doing about 300 knots and when he pulls you know straight vertical that's going to be a couple thousand feet that he's going to have to climb away so we'll get a block of altitude over wherever we're flying and then that'll keep us safe from other traffic and stuff like that atc will put a bubble around our formation but in that at that time, number four, we'll just hold position with the missing uh, aircraft no longer being there. Uh, and then once we're well past the, uh, the site, number three will rejoin and we'll get back together and go home. Second, have you flown in any missing man aerial formations in your time of flying fighter jets? Yes, one time. And it was a long sortie. We had to go all the way up to Georgia to do it. And it was someone, uh, I don't remember the details. It was someone that was part of Air Force Reserve Command and we had to we had to get a tanker so we took off out of homestead four ship went up refueled uh did the, the missing man and then we came back home uh it was a really long sortie but i mean it was an awesome honor to be able to do that finally when it comes time to choose pilots for the formation how do they go about choosing pilots for this particular formation uh so it just depends on what's the scheduled and, and who it's for if it's someone in your squadron then it's not going to be, you know, the squadron commander or the DO or anything like that because they're on the ground, you know, with the, with the family members and part of the, the services. But if it's a third party, then it just depends on uh, usually they'll have someone who's the pro Joe, the project officer for that missing man. And they'll go, hey, I'll, I'll coordinate everything. And then that person usually leads it. And then, you know, it's just whoever's on the schedule. Uh, as far as who else does it, I mean, they can request it. Like if it's something meaningful to you, you can go, hey, I want to be a part of that. And if scheduling can accommodate that, they will. Uh, I tried looking it up on Google, but I can't find a definitive answer that answers my questions. That was a senior pilot who was close to the fallen aviator that passed away and his wingman. I could be wrong. I thought I'd ask you to see anything about this particular topic. There's no real rule. I mean, it just depends on relationships and the scheduling availability and you know it just it depends there's there's no real hard and fast answer on that so to speak hope this makes it onto the channel in a future mover mailbag keep on doing what you're doing to make these future fighter jet pilots strive for their dreams and reach for the stars thank you for your service and keep making great content michael well thank you michael greg says hey mover quick question how much say do you have in fuel planning on a sortie love your show keep on doing what you do regards greg so I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, unlike other aircraft, fighters always take off full. So we always have, you know, full, full gas and stuff like that. Whether we add centerline tanks or wing tanks or anything like that is already determined as part of the SCL that is already pre predefined. So you don't have any say over that. As far as fuel planning on the mission, that's part of mission planning. So you have, you know, you'll set your own joker bingo. So when you cease maneuvering and when you absolutely need to go home and divert fuel and all that stuff, um, if, if the supervisor of flying or top three determine that you need an alternate, then you'll add that in your gas. So the, the fuel planning, once you take off or in mission planning is all determined by the flight lead. Or if there's no flight lead, just you. But as far as, you know, fuel planning beyond that, I mean, we just take off full. All right, this next one comes from Barry. Mover, this is probably a dumb question, but oh well. No, probably not. Uh, do fighters and twin engine 
Do pilots and twin engine fighters ever adjust the thrust for the two engines separately in normal flight? I assume not, but after searching, it is not something I was able to find a simple answer to. I did find a paper that talked about using differential thrust in an emergency when the aircraft may be damaged or not responding correctly. Also, I'm assuming the computers in F-22 may do this automatically as part of thrust factoring. I'm referring to something like the Hornet or the Tomcat F-15 or the Hornet in normal flight. Yes. I do it a lot in a T-38. You'll split throttles all the time in a T-38, and that is to keep the fuel balance because you have, you know, different tanks and one side will feed faster than the other or slower than the other or whatever. So you'll split the throttles uh, to try to keep the fuel flows matched because, you know, not there's tolerances and not they're not 100%. Didn't do it as much in the Hornet, but you, sometimes you might. Um, and then um, the F-22 doesn't do it automatically. I mean, it's the same thing where if, if you needed to, you would. Typically, jets with better fuel pumps and better fuel monitoring systems, you wouldn't have to as much or just depending on where the fuel cells are. But uh, yeah, I do it in the T-38 all the time. But anyway, thanks for the email, Barry. This one comes from Andrew, fighter pilot ethics. Hey, mover. I would like to begin by saying thank you for everything you've done with this channel. You're truly an inspiration role model to many of us. Hopefully I'll get to say this to your face someday. Now to my question. I'm a junior in college. I set the goal of getting a guard fighter slot by the time I graduate. Pretty ambitious, I know, but it's no harm in trying. I will save you the cheesy speech of how bad I want this job, but I will say this. I recently told my parents this goal of mine and they completely lost it as expected. They went off saying, I will turn into this murderer, a weapon for the government that will consume my life. I will be captured and tortured by terrorists. I mean, every single worst case scenario you can imagine. My response was to try and explain to her that yes, a fighter jet is a killing machine, hence why it shouldn't be put in the hands of the wrong people. I showed her very successful people that began their journey as fighter pilots, presidents, astronauts, doctors. Then I tried to explain to her my ethics that I hate war, so much so I want to be really good at keeping it away from my people, that the world is currently battling these really bad guys that don't deserve a place on the earth. It calmed her down, but now I get the disapproval stare. Ultimately, I have already made up my mind, but having the parents' support in this journey would be nice. How do I convince my parents that pilots are not these bloodthirsty barbarians, that they are moral people with a soul? Looking forward to your response and keep up the good work. Uh, cheers, Andrew. Wow, that's a tough one. Not in the sense that any of that is true. I mean, obviously, fighter pilots make up a cross section of America, you know, or, or whatever country you're talking about. You're going to have very religious people. Um, you know, I've, I've flown with, with guys that are super religious. They're Mormon, even. I mean, you know, it, it's from all walks of life. Um, I don't think anybody considers themselves barbarians or you know, murderers or anything like that. We go out and we do the mission uh, and answer the call. That's, I mean, that's what it boils down to. Yes, these aircraft are weapons of war. And the only way you can really call yourself peaceful is if you're capable of violence. I mean, that's just the way it is. That's, that's human nature. Otherwise, you're harmless. So the ability to inflict great violence and use restraint and not do it makes you very peaceful. So, yes, we have that capability. No one really, you know, goes, hey, all I want to do is go kill people. But knowing exactly what you said, there are times, um, I mean, imagine in World War II if that were the case. If people said, nah, you know what? I don't want to be a murderer. You know, I'm not going to go fight the Germans. Well, I mean, look at what the Germans did. Look at, you know, look at all of the history behind that. And so I don't think it, it's, it's not a black and white issue. Obviously, there's always going to be gray area. But the whole point is service to your country and service to your, your fellow man. And by man, I mean, you know, gender neutral term. Um, you're supporting, if you're the fighter pilot out there in an A-10, you're supporting the troops on the ground. You're saving lives on the ground. You know, if you're um, a CSAR, a combat search and rescue, you are directly rescuing people. Uh, you know, the jolly pilots like we've had on the channel and stuff like that so that others may live. If you are 
uh, on the pointy end of the spear, you are protecting your nation's interests. Now, there's politics always involved with that, but at the end of the day, you're taking an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that is why we're here and that's why we serve. So you have to come to grips with that yourself internally and you do the best you can of explaining it. But at the end of the day, it's your decision and it is your life on the line. And it, you are making that, that, that oath. You are taking that oath and you are making that sacrifice. You may not sacrifice your life. You might. Uh, it may just be your time and, you know, the time away from your family and stuff like that. But it, it may be, you know, you're signing a blank check up to and including your, your life, payable up to your life. So um, I think it's most important that you're okay with it. And then, you know, they're either going to accept it or they won't. I mean, uh, you know, it sounds, it sounds like they're already, you know, in this, and I mean, it's really ridiculous to call, you know, to say you're going to become a murderous barbarian. I mean, that's, um, that's just not how it works. You know, I mean, I, I wish I had a better answer for that. Um, captured and tortured by terrorists. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a realistic possibility if you're in bad guy land and you eject, but it's a very small probability. It's not something that, you know, happens regularly or anything like that, but uh, we get training for that. I mean, everything that they've talked about, we get training for, and we don't go out there and just indiscriminately, you know, killing or, or doing, you know, barbaric acts or anything like that. We get training. We get training for every single scenario they talked about. And you're not thinking about, uh, well, you know, I'm out here killing a whole bunch of people. You're thinking about, okay, I have got to uh, support these troops on the ground. So I've got to put my targeting pod on this, this objective. And I have to make sure that I know where the friendlies are. And I have to make sure I have every, the weapon settings right and stuff. You're not thinking about that stuff. And it doesn't make you a, a barbarian. It makes you mission oriented. So you're a professional and that's all it is. You're a professional warfighter. So good luck with that, Andrew. Um, I wish, I mean, unfortunately I can't really relate because my father was always very supportive and that's where I'm very lucky and fortunate that, you know, he was army national guard and he understood and, you know, he didn't like it when I deployed, but he understood that, you know, it is a calling greater than yourself. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things that's just tough to try to uh, convince other people when their mind's already made up. Hey Mover, my name is Kalen. My friends all know me as the guy who won't shut up about airplanes. Only recently have I found your channel and I'm so glad that I did. All of my life I wanted to fly for the Air Force or the Navy. I'm 18 years old and will be attending Oklahoma State University where I will study aviation management, specifically OSU's pro pilot degree. I'm also active in the FFA where I'm currently a New Mexico State FFA officer. I show market lambs and goats at the county, state, and national level with great success on top of that. Unfortunately, I have a peanut allergy. I'm also getting tested again soon, so I'm hoping and praying that I'll be able to be freed of that burden, and I know there isn't much I can do in the military with this allergy. I've been wondering, however, which would you say is the best route to join the military, reserves or ROTC? I still haven't figured out the best option, so I'm looking forward to your response. Thank you so much. You're the best. Um, whichever one hires you. First thing you want to do, serve your country. So either one of those works. Reserves, you're going to have to find a unit that's going to sponsor you or go unsponsored and, you know, roll the dice as far as getting a unit that actually will pick you up. It just depends on what units are, are having hiring boards. ROTC is a little bit more stable because, you know, there's X number of pilot slots. There's, um, you know, you're on a, a set timeline versus our, our OTS where, they may be having a board. They might not be having a board. They may pick you up. They might not pick you up. The nice thing about the OTS board for Air Force Reserve Command or Air National Guard is that you know you're going to go fly the aircraft that you get hired to go fly. So there's the certainty of what aircraft you're going to fly. The uncertainty is you may not get a full-time job when you're done with orders. You might. They might have, uh, they call them AGRs, um, which are the full-time uh, active duty orders or air reserve technicians, which are civil service orders, where, or um, civil service where you actually fly as a, as a, a GS-13. But there's uncertainty as far as, you know, where, where, what you'll end up doing when you finally finish your, your training pipeline. 
ROTC, you're going to go active duty. So there's uncertainty there too, but at least you know the timeline and you'll, you'll have a job for 10 years. If you get through pilot training, you got 10 years. Um, you know, it's a 10 year commitment and you just don't know what you're going to fly. And it's going to be based on the needs of the air force and they can pull you out of the cockpit and go put you somewhere else. And you know, you don't have that control. So there's pros and cons to both. Um, I would say, you know, being 18, I would do ROTC. And, you know, there are ways to do ROTC to a reserve, uh, like a palace acquire palace chase kind of deal when you're junior year. So look into that, try to get smart on that. Uh, look at guard reserve units and stuff like that. I mean, do both and that way you're properly positioned. So good question. So that'll do it for today's mover mailbag. Um, if you want to send me something, uh, PO Box 8594, Mandeville, Louisiana, 70470, just let me know if you do so I can know to go to the mailbox and uh, go get it. Uh, CWLemoyne, CWLemoyne.com, or move our mailbag at CWLemoyne.com if you want something read. I will say this. I have gotten a lot of questions lately that have already been answered on the channel, or I've answered in the make them tell you no um, frequently asked questions. So uh, I don't know. I'll say this up front. For when it comes to specific medical questions, I don't know. I'm not in the medical profession. I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor. I, I don't know. All I can tell you is try, apply, and let them be the ones to disqualify you. Don't disqualify yourself. That's why we say make them tell you no. Um, learn, look at the waiver guide, see what's required, get everything they ask for when they do ask for stuff, and then at that point, it's out of your hands. You know, you at least tried. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't use the, don't use the YouTube comment section or mover mailbag to try to disqualify yourself by saying, well, Hey, can I still be a fighter pilot? If I have this condition, it doesn't matter. Someone that's much more qualified than me will be the one that tells you yes or no. However, there's two resources I have available for you. Uh, make them tell you no.com, which redirects you to the military pilot FAQ. Uh, that I created with a bunch of other fighter pilots uh, last year. So check that out. It's got a bunch of questions that have already been answered um, uh, that we've even answered on the channel. There's also, you can go through the Mover Mailbag playlist and kind of see if I've answered your question there. Uh, also on Facebook, the Make Them Tell You No Facebook group, there's a lot of information. Uh, or you can ask your question there if it hasn't already been answered. So um, that's all I would say. Don't this is fun and this is a good, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to, to connect with everybody, but don't rely on this. You know, I, I am not the be all end all do your own homework and make sure you know the answer, but just don't give up. That's what it boils down to is don't let something you, you see on the internet be the reason that you don't accomplish your goals and achieve your dreams. Anyway, hope you guys are having a great week. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.